In an age where bytes hold more power than bullets and clicks can cause more chaos than clashes, the reality of our digital world is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Consider this, every 39 seconds, a cyber attack strikes. That's right, cybercrime has turned into a trillion dollar industry, eclipsing even that of the drug trade and profitability. These criminals prey on our digital ignorance, with 90% of attacks originating from our own human error or lack of action. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our virtual global audience. My name is Steve Remy, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar entitled Automated Cyber Risk Management to Achieve Digital Age Resilience. I'm the founder and CEO of Eight Degrees East, a strategic advisory company based in Switzerland. Eight Degrees East is also a UPU consultative committee member, and I serve as the co-rapporteur for the freight and transport thematic chapter alongside Lars Carlson of the global shipping company Maersk. Today, I'm joined by a diverse panel of experts in this domain. Allow me to please introduce them. Ms. Rasha Al-Abdali, Based in Muscat, Oman, Russia oversees the development of national policies and standards for governing the IT industry in Oman, providing guidance and consultancy services to government agencies, as well as conducting research on new technological trends. Russia is also a member at the National Task Force for Managing National Risks of Critical Infrastructure Services. Welcome, Russia. Thanks for joining. Hi, Steve. Hi, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be today with you here in this panel, and we wish uh, we have a fruitful session, hopefully, and discussion. Thanks. Mr. Massimiliano Ashi, Based in Rome, Italy, Massimiliano has been leading research and innovation activities in cybersecurity for Post Italian, the largest infrastructure in Italy, which is active in the areas of post and logistics, as well as financial, telco, and insurance services. Massimiliano currently chairs the DOT Post Group, DPG, at the Universal Postal Union, which governs, steers, and develops the DOT Post sponsored top level domain name. Ciao, Massimiliano. Great to have you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, to be here with you today. And the topics we will discuss, uh, I think, are very interesting and fits uh, our current uh, problems. So I'm very excited. And uh, let, let's start discussing. <laughs> and Ms. Terry Roberts, based in Washington, D.C., in the United States. Terry is the former Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence. Office of the U.S. Chief of Naval Operations and an Executive Director, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. She is a global cyber intelligence, risk, and national security executive, and the current founder, president, and CEO of White, White Hawk Inc., as well as an expert advisor for Eight Degrees East. Welcome, Terry, and thanks for agreeing to such an early start. I love this international panel. This is wonderful. Great to be here. Great. Our goal today is to be solution oriented. We want to deliver to the individuals and the organizations that are tuning in the following. Insights into establishing a robust cyber risk baseline. Understand action plans aimed at mitigating key vulnerabilities continuously. And thirdly, to strengthen overall cybersecurity posture and ensure operational continuity. We will achieve this through an interactive discussion today based on predefined topics and questions. We have an hour and a fair amount of topics to cover, but if we can, we will answer some select questions from our viewers, time permitting. If we do not have time, we still urge you to pose the questions in the chat. And if we have your email coordinates, we will revert to you in writing with responses in due course following the webinar. That said, let's get started with our first question. The first question or topic is, can next generation technologies effectively address 
the challenge of cyber threats in the postal sector, considering the complexities faced by both large and small operators. Massimiliano, this was, uh, was your topic. If you could give us a couple of uh, points of color, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Steve, for uh, the, the, the opportunity to talk uh, on this topic, because uh, since a few years, uh, uh, the postal sector has been uh, affected by many cyber attacks, uh, which uh, has been led by cyber criminals because uh, probably they found this is profitable. So as there is a, an economical uh, motivation basically behind the, these attacks, uh, we believe the, this will not stop and uh, will come again and again and again. Uh, so this is a real issue, as, uh, especially when uh, considering that probably uh, the response of our industry is still not adequate to the, to the threat. And uh, for example, when talking about uh, vulnerability management, uh, that could be a particularly effective uh, mitigation measure uh, to this phenomena. Uh, this is a particularly challenging, a particularly challenging issue, both for large operators and for the smaller ones in less developed countries, for different reasons, obviously. Uh, the larger ones uh, are facing uh, huge complexities, IT architecture, very extended uh, attack surface. Our services uh, are uh, particularly vulnerable. Also, uh, this is uh, for lacking uh, processes in uh, vulnerability management, especially. And the, the smaller operators uh, have instead to face uh, uh, skill gap issues uh, and the budget issues. So both uh, uh, would need uh, the support uh, of something different. No? We, we need uh, really to react uh, to this situation. And we are just trying to understand if we could leverage on next generation technologies, really leverage on reliable technologies that would be able to tackle this challenge. So this is what we ask to the, to the market. No? Is, is there a possibility to face these challenges? What, what do you think about this, Terry, for example? Terry? So I, I've had the luxury of, you know, being at the center of next generation capabilities, you know, for decades. And especially since 2009, um, the ability to dig in to thousands of software-based, SaaS-based, you know, AI ML based technologies and services. And 20 years ago, we weren't there. <laughs> uh, even 10 years ago, we started to have the capabilities, but they weren't proven at scale. But I can tell you that now, the last five years after billions of dollars in R&D, in university startups and spinoffs in a global pursuit, right, of resilience in the digital age that we now have a portfolio of technologies that can, and, and, and this is the difference, they can automate obviously manual processes, okay, but they can also come at the challenges in a totally different way using big data, using mathematical algorithms, right? Using software-based implementations that can be remote and be updated. So even though your sector is as complex as the energy sector or as any other sector, right? That is global, international, interactive, um, cooperative, right? This is the only way that you're gonna become resilient 
because you can't throw enough manpower at it, right? It can't, this is moving at the speed of software and you can't throw enough money at it and we don't have limit, limited, limitless resources. So it is only by piloting and implementing these next generation capabilities. And I'll go into some of the more specifics later about what some of the approaches are. But if you're not using them, you're not resilient and you're wasting your valuable resources. This is very fantastic news, Terry. And uh, uh, it is uh, very interesting to, to learn that uh, there's a way to demonstrate on the field uh, the effectiveness of these technologies. And uh, this means probably we exciting times are coming, no? When we finally- They're here, <laughs> they're here. <laughs> Russia, any comments there? Uh, well, uh, as they mentioned, like the the uh, the technologies are developing and evolving, especially nowadays uh, with the AI and uh, the big data, um, the, the the learnings of of the threats uh, and the database is expandable, you know, and uh, that we could address the issues there. We just need to make exactly. sure that um, these technologies are well configured you know to to uh, to align with the organization's security policies as well and i think we can uh, we can utilize and uh, optimize uh, the offerings of of uh, the uh, next generation uh, solutions perfect talking of ai and machine learning that brings us to the next topic um topic 2 how close are we to achieving 100% reliable, transparent, and cyber attack proof AI ML technologies for affordable automation in the postal value chain? Massimiliano, again, if you want to sort of set the stage here. Thank you, Steve. This uh, topic is really touching me because uh, I really believe uh, these new technology are so promising as uh, they would enable probably the to automate uh, uh, all a set of operations which are particularly heavy for uh, for the operators and uh, if this uh, kind of automation would be able to uh, be affordable you know so that uh, everyone could be able to to, to bring this technology in, I would say. And this would surely help to fill the gaps between the most advanced operators from a technical point of view and the less advanced ones. And the gap is huge. And uh, this is a very big problem because we are working in the same value chain and we are strictly interconnected uh, one among the others. So, uh, if uh, these technologies could help uh, to address this issue, this would be fantastic. At the same time, uh, we need to be sure that uh, these technologies are reliable enough as uh, researchers uh, showed up that these technologies can be sometime uh, vulnerable no, itself. So how could we be sure no, that these are uh, is uh, safe enough, secure enough uh, when using it for cyber defense. This is very important. And last but not least, uh, we need uh, uh, these systems to take uh, quick decisions because they can see things uh, human beings are not able to see. And uh, of course, we need to be quick and take many decisions at a time, but at the same time, maybe uh, after a while, we need to verify these decisions no? and to understand why this decision has been taken. So we need transparency, explainability to be particularly developed. Uh, mm -hmm. Are these technology mature enough to grant such, uh, such that such requests uh, are satisfied? Uh, what, what's your uh, thoughts about that, Terry? 
Well, I, I do think it's funny because, of course, in the news over the last year, you know, advanced AI has, you know, taken over. But I took my first course in AI in 1985 in graduate school. <laughs> you know, AI and machine learning. Uh, and at Carnegie Mellon, the first school of machine learning was established in the early 2000s. Um, so, uh, and I saw one of their first major experiments called NEL, Never and Ever Learning. Um, and, and so we have been working on all of this for a long time. It, the, today's you know, capabilities are not the result of an overnight <laughs> uh, you know, technology advance. Um, but, to, but to explain a little bit um, about where we've been and where we could go. So traditional cybersecurity, right, is as uh, Amma said, is based on you know, the, the number of controls, the audits, the checklists, the foundations, making sure the, the best of breed frameworks. And then it has been very additive. You keep adding technology and you have this complex technology stack, okay? Well, for 10% of the world who have, who are big companies or big government organizations who have resources, then, you know, they have that. But the other 90% often don't have anything but best practices, okay? And they don't even have in-house talent. So it's by using these proven AI-based, big data-based, cyber risk and threat monitoring, both inside the networks, across your operational technologies, and from a hacker perspective, that you can have a 360 view of your risk and threat continuously, and then mitigate the highest priority risks. That's where we want to get to, and we have the capabilities, and they are affordable. Great. Great. Thank you for, for that. And uh, we, we have really high hopes, uh, and uh, we are also very excited. At the same time, you, you can understand that we need uh, to have uh, evidences and uh, mm -hmm. when collecting uh, some kind of information like the ones you're giving us today, this is uh, very interesting to us. Thank you very much, Ted. I just would like to comment um, about uh, Steve's question when he mentioned, uh, how close are we to achieving 100% reliable transparent and cyber attack proof? Um, well, I would like to say that there is no 100% guarantee in this. No, 100%. <laughs> Anything is hackable. It is only about how much delay we can make for it to happen and how fast can or does it take us to respond to it. Even if uh, you have the best technology solutions in the world, people are the weakest point. And in AI cases, if no proper data sets and algorithms are configured, anything could accidentally happen. That's why in the GRC domain, we always talk about reasonable assurance and uh, and that's something to make uh, to make it very clear to all people in the postal services that if we would want to embed uh, security and cybersecurity controls we need to 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 have that kind of percentage where we will be hackable but we need to be ready and we need to be resilient uh, about yes. it yes so rasha i would like to build on that the way i look at it is if you're doing the, the monitoring, the prioritization, and the key risk mitigation, then when you have an event, you're going to be able to operate through it because the crown jewels are protected, right? And you see it almost immediately as opposed to it happening over a period of time and your operations are brought to their knees. Exactly. Great. Moving on, another fun topic. Um, this should this should spark some some uh, 
some dialogue for sure. What measures should the postal service organizations undertake to combat the growing threats of ransomware, phishing, and social engineering, considering the, po the potential implications of data breaches and financial loss? Um, Rasha, this was, uh, this was your topic. So maybe you wanna uh, tee this one up a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, organizations need to take proactive steps to be ready for tackling the, these uh, security threats. They need to have effective incident handling response process and uh, right resources to deduct and prevent uh, those attacks from happening. They need to have clear escalation metrics for reporting attacks that uh, mark as high severity and have it properly communicated to the respective stakeholders. So when uh, attacks occur, they ensure uh, reporting is done to the right channels or through the right channels and decisions are made for handling uh, attacks can be timely made. Uh, this is very important. And um, especially as uh, Terry was mentioning, uh, we cannot focus on everything. We need to focus on the high risk uh, threats and uh, because every organization has scarcity of resources and budget. And uh, I think we need to, to focus more on the, on the high impact uh, and uh, high risks. Uh, they need to have uh, clear strategies in place for handling such attacks based on an agreed risk appetite uh, set by the top management, especially when it comes to ransomware. Um, they need to understand, uh, you know, um, before they get into the attacks, you know, they need to, 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 to plan ahead that if we have a ransomware, how, how, how are we going to, you know, handle that? They need to have data classification in place so that if uh, ransomware hits and uh, the data that is, uh, you know, uh, controlled uh, by the ransomware is, is really uh, very critical to the organization, what decisions can be made? Do they need to pay? For, for the, that ransomware, uh, do they not need to pay? Uh, how they would react to it? That needs to be, you know, a pre, uh, uh, you know, uh, planned ahead. And uh, because these kind of attacks are expected to happen, so an organization needs to be ready, uh, you know, um, in advance for uh, such attacks. And they need to understand what kind of decisions and who are. Uh, the people in the organization who, are, who can make the decisions for that. Uh, they need also to uh, have an effective security awareness program for their employees, uh, for the management, for the technical teams and end users, as well as security, uh, you know, campaigns for their clients to educate about the several types of threats and uh, what impact can they bring and how to avoid them versus dealing with them uh, when the attacks take uh, place. Uh, they need... Uh, uh, to have proper uh, data classification, I mentioned that. So this is all is important to 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 do it proactively, so that uh, you can ensure um, you know resilience and you ensure that you can really properly handle uh, such a uh, attacks when they uh, really occur. So I think Russia has shown the complexity of the requirements and. With our uh, risk and threat um, and solution data partners, today, a whole industry of risk and threat monitoring and risk assessment uh, capabilities can do uh, a comprehensive assessment on any legal organization in the world within 48 to 72 hours. But what's most important is within that assessment, and right, this is this is not on premise. This is not intrusive. Um, these are uh, capabilities that banks use today um, for business clients, and insurance groups use today for cyber liability insurance underwriting. And within the assessments, you can dig into the compliance across 80 different frameworks, the maturity of the organization, the key risks that they have, and provide a prioritized action plan, okay? And again, it's automated, it's using big data, it's using AI and ML. So what this does, it, it arms that organization with this information in a very digestible and understandable and actionable way 
so that they can get at, right? Their top vulnerabilities, okay? So that gets you kind of to here, <laughs> okay? For the specific, Steve, the specific issues that you brought up here, we have found in the thousands of assessments that we have performed globally, that often it gets to basics, okay? Automating patch management is like one of the number one issues, right? And it prevents a myriad of all vulnerabilities. And the other one is cybersecurity awareness training, because I think, as you mentioned, um, the statistics are that about 90% of all cyber events are the result of human actions, okay? So, and here's a technology again. There are a whole portfolio of great online courses, companies, programs, right? Of all different price point levels to be able to implement um, effective annual cybersecurity awareness training that's focused on your industry, that's focused on, is on what's been happening to your industry. And that combined with the automated risk assessment um, can help prevent or mitigate the impact of all of these high risk events. That, that's fantastic. I totally agree with both, both of you. And uh, I would uh, just stress that uh, uh, still information uh, and uh, training is uh, needed here and technologies uh, have produced uh, particularly good results uh, encountering these, uh, these threats also in the past that we still uh, need to switch uh, from uh, reactive to proactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're actually making good time here, which is great. So, you know, Switzerland would be my 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 adopted country would be proud. <laughs> um, we've got um, two more questions topics, and now we're moving more into the the policy and governance uh, area. So, the the next topic is how can postal services ensure consistent security policies and data protection across the supply chain, considering their complexities of integrated and semi-integrated systems. Again, Rasha, if you could uh, maybe give a little bit of an intro there. Sure, and this is very important because if you're doing a really great job, but you are integrated to, um, you know, other organizations and, uh, you know, stakeholders across the supply chain and they're not doing a good job, then it's all compromised. So it is very important that uh, uh, to have uh, third party security policies in place that has to be integrated as part of uh, the outsourcing and vendor management process for the for the uh, postal organizations. Uh, they need to ensure that their security policies are well reflected in their contracts with the various external um, stakeholders across the chain to ensure that data is protected and data protection controls are implemented and attacks uh, are well communicated and handled when they occur. Uh, it is also very important that they need to set uh, proper SLAs that uh, uh, guarantees uh, the acceptable levels of availability of their services. They need to conduct regular auditing and security assessments to ensure the vendor compliance to security requirements, especially those set by regulators. Uh, Terry mentioned a uh, few minutes ago about uh, um, the automated risk assessment, you know, and the auditing, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, but also when you are uh, integrated with other vendors, uh, or suppliers or other clients across the supply chain, you need to ensure that you have the ability to, to, to check their compliance as well too. Uh, so in um, one of the best practices is that when you, when you sign a contract, you need to make sure that you at least embed as one of the conditions, your ability to audit uh, you know, uh, that vendor or uh, or the, the, the integrated service, at least with, with a certain, uh, you know, external stakeholder. Excellent. So I agree 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, one thing we tell uh, 
all companies and organizations to do is do an assessment of your crown jewels, okay? Um, and, and UPU as an organization, right? Because you're the same sector, you share a lot of the same crown jewels across yourselves. And what that helps you do is to then prioritize the resilience of the crown jewels so that if someone breaks in, they can't get to those, right? You can you can operate through it. And, and the continuum that we have put in place as a part of our cyber risk program recommendations for every organization is the continuous monitoring, the prioritization of the vulnerabilities, a focused at least once a year pen test to validate those vulnerabilities. And again, this now can be done remotely through software-based capabilities that are half the price of traditional pen testing, okay? And then if you're a really large, complex organization, you might wanna have a red team, okay? And then you take all of those findings and then you make sure that your policies and your programs are focused on what are the issues that you have found, okay? And then you brief your executive team, excuse me, <clears throat> at least quarterly on how you're doing, okay? In English, meaning in non-cyber <laughs> language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, to make it so that then you can say, I need the resources to do this, okay? And, and you need the whole executive team buying into this, that being resilient to online crime, fraud, and disruption is a core part of your business and your organization. And then finally, you can then do once a year uh, what Rasha was talking about, which is an, a, an exercise it. Exercise, who's in charge? What's your communications plan? Do you have someone on speed dial to come in for response, right? Um, so it's a continuum and it's continuous, okay? And then you base your policies on the results of all of that. Oh, supply chain, sorry. So the risk assessments that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. um, both business risk and cyber risk, business risk being financial, organizational, leadership, okay, um, are, are all automated commodities that you can buy today. So if you go to on my website, because I don't productize, there's under innovative solutions, mapped to the Gartner categories, you can see exemplars of the type, these types of next generation um, solutions and they're global, okay? Um, that can address the different areas to include supply chain risk. And by the way, you can just do an annual business risk, cyber risk, if you can't afford a continuous approach. Very, very interesting discussion. I also would like to to add to the discussion uh, to stress that uh, the UPU at UPU we develop uh, standards, so we could mm -hmm. uh, develop uh, proper standards for cybersecurity uh, in order to guarantee consistent uh, methodologies to be adopted uh, across the sector. At the same time, uh, these standards should be should not be bureaucracy. Uh, but uh, uh, smart, smart standards, adaptable standards, which would fit to anyone who would like to adopt and uh, according to different budget, uh, cultures, uh, and needs. Uh, at the same time, I believe that technology also here can uh, support a lot, as Tracy told, 
and uh, we need to push on uh, integration among different systems. System integration is very critical in my opinion and interoperability is uh, the key for uh, efficiency, you know, information exchange. Last but not least, I would say that also the DotPost group uh, as a mission uh, delivers uh, security services for the community. And this is uh, one way we are trying to adopt to support this process, the process you are depicting by delivering uh, trustable services, uh, services that are available on the market, of course, uh, but which you can rely on when uh, delivering your own digital services. So this could be one way or at least uh, one possibility to improve the situation. Excellent. Rasha, did you have a follow-up? Um, well, um, I think we, we've covered the most points and I think uh, it's very important that um, you don't work in silos when it comes to uh, building uh, effective security, uh, you know, a program for your organization, your services, especially in the um, in the postal services, because you are working with so many with a network, and you need to make sure that uh, you know there is a harmony between what you do and what others are doing, and the collaboration is very important. Building um, or working within a framework uh, and collaboration is very important. Awareness across the chain is very important. Uh, I believe. Uh, um, you know, it's it's a shared responsibility. Uh, if we would want to to make sure that we achieve the the, the continuous resilience uh, of our services, you know, one recommendation that I've been making the past few years, um, especially to great organizations such as yourselves, and through a mechanism like Dot Post, is providing. Um, services of common concern. So even you, you were talking about suppliers, especially regionally, you may share a lot of the same suppliers. So why should each individual organization do a pay for a risk assessment, right? Why not do it once, right? And then share it across the members. So therefore with limited resources, you can have an effective supply chain risk program in place. Um, but, you know, and I'm, I'm volunteering you, Masami uh, 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 you know, you can have it in one place and then have benefit. Same thing with some of these um, uh, uh, next generation technology solution licenses, right? Um, the prices go down exponentially with volume. <laughs> Right. We, we expected this. So yes. uh, we, yes. we are very happy to explore these opportunities. Yep. And and I mean like it goes from a thousand dollars a risk assessment to two hundred dollars a risk assessment. Do you, you see what I'm saying? It's it's dramatic because take advantage of that it's software based. <laughs> so so things like that, I think. And, and you can pilot, right? So you, you can, one, one member or a couple of members can pilot a capability together, show the impact across UPU, and then others can decide, ah, do I, do I want to uh, leverage this capability? Is it the right thing for me? Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, Let's move on to the, the final topic, um, which is how can postal services ensure effective business continuity in the face of digital transformation, especially in critical areas like medical and financial services while mitigating risks and ensuring stakeholder communication and testing mitigation plans. Rasha, you want to yeah. do a little bit on that, please? Sure, uh, this is a very important uh, topic, uh, especially nowadays when we talk about uh, in the uh, latest uh, UPU um, forums and, uh, and conferences, they, we have entered the, the, uh, the, um, the domains of delivering 
products, not just normal packages, but we're talking about medical services, we're talking about financial services, and these are very critical services. We're delivering life, not just packages. And it's, it's very important to take uh, a business continuity uh, uh, seriously uh, and, uh, and put the right measures. And um, uh, how, how, do we, how do we ensure we have effective business continuity um, you know, uh, in, in place? Uh, first of all, uh, postal services need to conduct, uh, first of all, there is, a, there is a homework that needs to be done properly, which is conducting business impact analysis to identify uh, critical services that need to be taken uh, good care of uh, in the occasion of security attacks. That helps in setting the right priorities for building sufficient mitigation plans and required RTOs, RPOs. Um, how much amount of time can we, uh, you know, uh, can we afford to 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 get our services, um, you know, uh, recovered? How amount of data uh, is uh, our data loss is acceptable? So if we get to to really, you know, uh, what are our actual uh, uh, you know, critical services, and we prioritize them, and then we focus uh, on that. That helps us really to to uh, to have uh, uh, accurate plans in place uh, with the right uh, measurement of of what are the acceptable, you know, uh, RTOs and RPOs. They need to uh, have proper information assets inventory in uh, in place to identify all valuable assets for those critical services, such as network devices and systems which will require active backup implementation plans and tests. This is a very important uh, step. And they need to identify the emergency teams who will be involved in activating the business continuity plans, uh, communicate them well, and keep them up to date along with their contact details. So having uh, the right plans in place, the right people uh, who are competent to, to uh, activate and execute these plans is very important to step, but we need to have them always up to date and we need to have all of the, you know, uh, the details of those people uh, so that whenever there is a, you know, an incident or there is a, a, a disaster happening, you know, we can, uh, you know, uh, put uh, things in timely manner uh, to, to recover our services. Uh, it is very important that we have our, the postal service to have regular tests uh, uh, you know, conducted and test results need to be reported. This will ensure any failure is addressed and weak points are rectified. Uh, so the, the right controls are always there and they are uh, effective. It is very important for uh, ensuring business continuity to have redundancy mechanism in place so that availability doesn't get affected. Uh, this includes having the disaster recovery center ready and equipped to take over running the critical services. I think these are very important steps and uh, points to be considered if we or any you know postal service organization needs to build a uh, you know um, an effective uh, continuity continuity process in pl uh, planning in place. Absolutely. So, I would think because many of your organizations have <clears throat> been have existed for decades or longer, that what we forget is our architectures have evolved, right? They weren't designed yesterday and built just yesterday, right? They've evolved, you've added things, you've changed things, right? But you still have a lot of legacy hardware and software. So for Rasha's points, I always recommend an architecture review, but mapped to your business functions, okay? So that you have visibility of this function is reliant on these databases, on these business applications, on these communications or relay systems, or these operational technologies. Because with that visibility, then <clears throat> you can make decisions of how you want to migrate to a next generation architecture over time by design. So for instance, sometimes I, I tell people don't spend money on cybersecurity. If you, if you have software 
especially business applications that are more than 10 years old, just buy updated software. Because old software, all the windows and doors are open. And you won't have business continuity because they can take down that business function very easily. Okay. Another cloud provisioning. Um, many older organizations have their databases on premise, right? On old servers. And it can be a lot less expensive and, and much more resilient with the right next generation cloud provisioning, okay? They are doing better security than you're doing on premise. And then Rasha's point on asset management. Because the architectures have evolved, a lot of times you have shadow IT that you don't even know exists because you've forgotten about it and you don't have visibility into it. And that's another backdoor for criminals. By the way, with these cyber risk outside monitoring, we can discover all the shadow IT and then you can bring it down by design and close that. All of these things are central to business continuity. And so the last point is, if you're giving it to your IT people or your engineers, and the business or the organization's leadership are not involved in these conversations, then it's not being done effectively because many times um, the technical side of the organization de it doesn't understand all of the pieces of the business functions and operations. It's a joint conversation. It's something you have to do as a team. Very, very interesting. Also, this topic is uh, critical because uh, why do we need uh, business continuity in the postal sector? No, uh, especially <laughs> when considering the many sizes of the companies uh, operating all over the world. Uh, First of all, we have to remember we are not just delivering postal and logistics services, but we are a point of reference for citizens. And we are uh, delivering uh, many kinds of services uh, other than the postal ones, uh, which are considered still considered very important in many countries. But uh, you, you can imagine some of us are delivering pensions, uh, are delivering uh, universal uh, uh, income and services. So uh, people need our services because we are also still also uh, not thinking about business uh, uh, only, but uh, to deliver services to the citizens too. That's why business continuity is particularly relevant. At the same time, you should consider uh, different budgets uh, and uh, availability. Uh, there are uh, countries which uh, struggle to to understand how to how could I implement. So uh, there's a strong demand uh, uh, for both the kind of uh, operators and countries to reduce costs uh, of implementing and uh, uh, operating uh, business continuity solutions. This is uh, one request for the market. Uh, is a very strong need, and uh, I, I believe we can do a lot here. Uh, there's a uh, lot of things we could do. Uh, cloud services, platforms, and infrastructures are probably one of the best options for low-budget solutions because these are particularly mm -hmm. costly, but at the <laughs> same time, cost structure is particularly flexible. You can turn on, on and off yes. uh, services as needed. So yes. uh, this is one way, one possible approach. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point about the, you can turn it on and off, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and this also came back to, uh, what was the saying that you said before we went uh, live? Uh, that cyber is a team sport. Cybersecurity is a team sport. So this yeah. whole point, and I've seen this 
many times in the corporate world where uh, the IT don't talk to the executives and vice versa. And right. it's right. a recipe for disaster in the end. Uh, yes. So I mean, I mean, in many ways, executives and managers have abrogated the responsibility on this because they see it as technical. Sure. And we don't do that with finance. No. But financial risk, everybody owns. Mm -hmm. Well, cyber risk, everyone needs to own. Yep. Very good point. We are at um, nine minutes left in the uh, uh, in the webinar, which is perfect um, because I, I would like to, so we can end on time. Um, this has been a great um, discussion, and I think that a lot of fantastic ideas and um, and areas to explore for for the people that are listening. Uh, has been shared um, and is available uh, following this. Um, I would invite you all uh, just to give a couple of minutes uh, quickly, final thoughts, uh, and then I will conclude this. So Rasha, if you would like to go uh, with a, a few closing remarks from your side, please. Well, I will start from where you ended. Uh, again, I stress on that uh, security is a team sport. It's very important that we identify all of the stakeholders who are very important to our business and what are the critical services that we are handling, what are the uh, valuable assets you know, uh, that are part of these services and then build a complete uh, strategy in line with the business uh, uh, objectives. This is just to ensure the proper governance of where what we really need to protect is really important to the business and to our services. And we need, and, and all of everything else is just around that, to be honest. Uh, we need to, to, uh, to direct our investments toward that. Um, we need to direct all of our security projects toward that. Uh, so all of the efforts, all of the trainings and awareness has to be around that so that we don't invest on the wrong place, on the wrong direction, that the business is on the other side and we are on a different side. I think this is very important. Uh, if we really want to do security properly to keep the business up and running. Excellent. Thank you very much. Massimiliano, a few words yes. for yourself? I, I believe uh, the, the time is up for uh, the postal sector. Uh, it's not uh, anymore the time to wait for things to happen. We have to be proactive. We have to do something uh, concrete to counter the cyber threats that we are raising uh, every, every day, I would say. We are not sharing ideas, experiences. Uh, we are not exploring the market uh, uh, seriously, in my opinion. We are not, uh, this uh, is based on evidences. The evidences are the cyber incidents, uh, which I could read on. And uh, every time I see the same fraud schemas, for example, uh, being applied to the, the players of the postal sector, this is terrific. We, we should share information. We should operate as one. We should uh, exchange information. We should leverage on high tech, uh, in order to uh, fill the gaps and uh, to raise, level up the overall cybersecurity level of the entire value chain, because we are operating as a one, uh, and uh, this must happen also in the field of digital services. So uh, it, it's time to to act, and uh, we are here to to sustain this process, uh, this uh, maturity process that uh, we need to happen. Really need to happen. Thank you, Massimiliano. Excellent. Terry, you know, the floor is yours. Yeah. When when I when I meet with um, sectors like yours that are global and complex and have a, a combination of IT and OT, um, and our sent and their business functions are sent and continuity are central to our world. Okay. Um, I, I always get the feeling from everybody that you're overwhelmed and rightly so, right? You're drowning in everything that you have to do and the importance of doing it right. And the reason that I have focused on um, cost-effective, scalable automation, 
um, and technology solutions is because it's the only way to lift that burden and make each organization effectively identify, prioritize, and address your key digital age risks. And I need everyone who watches this program to have a sense of urgency of getting this done because when you are hit, it can bring an organization to its knees. It can cost millions of dollars, okay? And we're giving it all to the bad guys. <laughs> You know, that's that's the other thing I hate. We're making the bad guys rich, okay? So with your limited resources, you want to put them, as Sasha said, in the right place, okay? Mm -hmm. So I have a recommendation. UPU, do a risk-based, a risk assessment on every entity in UPU, Share that individual risk assessment only with the individual organization. Remember, these are, you, you can buy them, right? Um, but then there are portfolio analytics across by sector, subsector, region, size that can be shared with the whole organization, right? No names, just the regions, the size, the subsector, okay? And then through dot .post, you can, you can learn what are the key, the top three issues, right? That we're seeing based on real data, and then what are the services of common concern that you might want to put in place to address those issues. And I'm telling you within 90 days, you will see improvements because you will arm everybody with a different perspective on themselves and something that is understandable and actionable. Um, and then you can decide what else you may want to do over time. Great. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, <clears throat> a few comments from my from my side. First of all, I want to thank uh, the three of you uh, for taking the time and really creating, I believe, a, a very uh, rich and insightful uh, webinar. I think on the back of this, you know, there are follow-ups for anybody that's listening and anybody that we talk to after this, um, because the the situation's real, <clears throat> it's increasing, and uh, an action needs to be taken. I've seen this in in many different uh, guises throughout my corporate career as well, and I'm seeing that today uh, at an inc increasingly uh, high rate. So. Um, we wanted to we wanted to come up with solutions today and propose solutions and steps for the for the viewers. I think we've done that, but more importantly, it's now the onus is on the uh, on the the owners locally and internationally to reach out if they have questions, comments, if they if they need support. Uh, support's there, um, and this is this is the goal of the consultative committee is really to bring this public private partnership. Uh, the best in breed in different areas to to be able to uh, to raise everybody's game, but more importantly, as we're talking about cybersecurity, to 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 guard the assets that we work every day uh, to bring a better value to to our constituents, which are the people that we deliver to. Uh, so, thank you again very much, uh, everybody. Uh, I hope that this was uh, as as. Uh, as joyful for you as it was for me. I wish you a great day. Uh, take action and be safe. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.